Hello everybody, this is Joe with another SQL Skills Insider demo video. And this is part two of a two-part deadlock series. The, the first part, I reviewed how to capture deadlock information. And now in this part two, I'm going to actually go through how to interpret the data that you've captured. And over the last few years, I've gotten questions on, on recommended resources for deadlock troubleshooting. And by far, the number one resource that I've uh, drawn people to uh, involved Bart Duncan's blog series on deadlocks. So if you just do a search on Bart Duncan Microsoft deadlock you'll find his blog posts and they're very helpful and they go over how to capture information like I did in the previous video but also on top of that how to interpret the data. And it's a little bit dated uh, but it is still applicable so for example it doesn't go over extended events or how to pull from the system health session but the overall spirit of it has remained the same and I definitely recommend it. So I too in this uh, in this uh, video will be going over how to interpret the data that you capture uh, the XML data and why don't we jump right in I have a query that I used in the last video and this was written by Jonathan Cahayas and Paul Randall and essentially it pulls system health information and specifically we're looking at deadlock information that has happened since the SQL Server instance last restarted or the system health session last started in which case I have one row, one deadlock for us to evaluate. And so I'm going to just click on this and you'll notice it brings it in SQL Server Management Studio just fine. Although this is not where I'm going to be interpreting this data. I'm going to actually save this off as a file and it saves as a .xml file. And which tool you use to read through it, totally up to you. Uh, in this case I'm going to use a tool called uh, EditPad Pro and there's a limited uh, freeware version of it where you can use it for X number of days or trialware and in this case I purchased this app Edipad Pro and what I like about it is it just allows you to click on actual XML tags and it shows you the beginning and the end tag and there's other tools that do this as well uh, the key is not to get caught up in the tool but just to make sure that when you're looking through the deadlock output it's very readable and that you can extract data out easily so jumping right to it, which I already have, we have a deadlock list, which is the, the outer tag. So this, in terms of the hierarchy, we've got deadlock list beneath that deadlock. And then we start getting into the information about the deadlock event itself. So the very first thing that we look at or that I look at is the victim list. So which process got killed uh, in the deadlock chain? And in this case, I'm looking at it says process and then here's this number behind it. And this by itself, is not helpful. It's not like session ID when you're live troubleshooting, uh, but it is helpful within the context of XML output. So if I go ahead and do a control C and then control F to find any reference to this victim process, it'll bring me right to the process ID node under the process list. So under process list, you'll find uh, here's one process this was our victim because it brought me right here based on that process ID if you scroll a little bit further down you see another process so there's the closing tag for our victim process here's the opening tag for another process if I scroll a little bit down you'll see the close tag as well so the first thing we're trying to figure out is who got killed and what survived and in which case I say okay well this is the the victim ID brought me to this process I'm going to start extracting out useful information from this and so uh, okay, I'm going to highlight this process element, and within it there's different attributes, and I'm going to go over the 80% of the time set of attributes. There are attributes in here that you might have to use in edge cases, um, or they might be scenarios that just happen to be the way your database uh, was designed. You're going to see different scenarios more than others, but in this case, over the years, I'm going to be calling out the 80% that has typically been most helpful to troubleshooting deadlock issues. All right, so first thing I'm going to look at in this block, in this process block, uh, first thing that I'm drawn to is the weight resource. So if I look here, I see, okay, it says RID, and which, okay, I'm going, all right, we already have a row lock that's involved in this. And then based on that, I know if you look at books online, there's a reference that shows the format of a RID versus a format of a page versus a table resource. And in which case I know for RID, this first number is the database ID. This second number is the file ID. This third number is the page. And then this fourth is the slot or the, the row ID. So I know that eight in my case, if I went to sys.databases and looked up the ID, I'd see that it was the AdventureWorks Data Warehouse application or database. 
and so I know which database is involved now and then we now know what the page is and we also know what the row ID was or the row number or slot so that's the first piece of information I'm pulling out the next is when was the transaction started so was it started a week ago how long has it been open was it started two minutes ago this is key information to get a timeline and then the next thing is okay so what was it what was the lock mode uh, that this process was holding so in this case it was looks like it was killed trying to do a lock mode of shared and then the status was suspended so it was waiting to get that shared lock and then at the time its SPID was its session ID was 53 although this isn't terribly helpful to us because the Fox already left the hen house so to speak you you don't know whether 53 is really still that original process as a matter of fact this process got killed so it's a, a very strong chance that it is not the same session ID so I don't pay too much attention to this but I am just calling it out and then train count this is something that I'm definitely paying attention to so it, was there one transaction open were there four transactions open when it got killed and rolled back uh, that's important information to know in terms of the context and then I'm also looking at the last batch started, the last batch completed. Again, more timeline, you know, what was happening at the time, uh, what was the last request, and then, or the last batch completed. And then we start getting into metadata around uh, the actual request that got killed. So in this case, we've got client app, and this is telling me Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio query. So we know somebody had SQL Server Management Studio, in this case it was me open and then the host name was the name of my laptop so this could say okay if you have 18 app servers where was the host that had the deadlock victim and then the login name so this is often meaningful as well now I've had plenty of deadlocking scenarios where it's all generic so client app might be app XYZ and everybody comes in through app XYZ so you really can't differentiate so I realized that not all the time is this data helpful but you want to extract it anyhow because you don't want to leave any stone unturned and so you extract it anyhow and then within the context of the other pieces of information we'll cover you you put that together and you build your narrative okay so we've got the client app the host name where was it coming from the login name what was the login of the victim and then to me a very important information a piece of information here is the isolation level so in a concurrent system, so let's say you want uh, your SQL Server database and the application against that database to be highly concurrent and you want lots of applications or you want lots of requests to be able to update data, let's say, in the same table. The higher the isolation level, the more difficult it is to do this without longer term blocking and the risk of deadlocking depending on how you've coded your, your, database, uh, your database queries. So in this case, serializable is an anti-pattern that I look out for because it's the most restrictive isolation level. And uh, it's often an isolation level that either people don't realize they're using it or the application developer might say, no, we're not using it. So in terms of using uh, evidence and pulling evidence out of this file, I definitely recommend no matter what, you want to pull out isolation level and go, okay, the victim or the, the request that survived was running under XYZ isolation level. And that just helps build the story of, okay, why did this happen? If it's a very restrictive isolation level, you know that there's an increase in the chance that it might happen depending on other circumstances. Okay, so last little area I'm looking at is the current DB. We already knew that, we already assumed that based on the row ID value, but there's just more affirmation that this is the row ID. And then the next thing question you might be asking is, well, what was the victim actually running? What T-SQL was it running? Where was it when it actually had uh, the deadlock um, rollback, the, the victim rollback? And in which case, so I've already gone through the process tag, but if I go down here, you'll see execution stack, but let's go a little bit further to input buffer. All right, so here we go. This is what uh, we're showing select from fact internet sales, where sales order number, and then the actual ID. And so now we know, okay, this is the query at the time that the deadlock occurred. And there's another way to actually look at the involved object, and I'll get to that towards the end of this presentation, at the end of this demo. All right, so we've covered the victim so and if I see here this is the end of the process this is the beginning of the process we know it was the victim because it was in the victim list so then we see this next process here and if I scroll down you'll see where it begins and where it ends it's highlighted in blue and I just rinse and repeat so I go through here and I go okay alright this is the request that survived what was its last transaction starting date and how many transactions did it have open and 
uh, what was the wait time? That was something I hadn't brought out there. So uh, in this case, it was waiting seven seconds or 7,082 milliseconds. Um, so what was it waiting on? How long? And you pull all the same information you would for the victim. And it helps, again, build the process, uh, build the narrative of who was involved, how were they configured, and what were they running. Because, again, I'm going to look at that input buffer. And in that case, I'm saying, oh, okay, it was also running a select from the same table, except with a different order ID. And if I look at the different order ID, it says uh, 086 is the last three digits versus uh, 090. And that also matches what we know up above where we saw the RID, the actual final number was 27. So it was slot 27 versus slot 30. So we know same page, deadlock, different rows. <clears throat> Now the final piece of the puzzle here is just a breakout of the resource list. So uh, this will say, all right, you know what the processes were that were involved in the deadlock. These were the actual resources that were being held and who owned what and who was waiting for what. So in this case, if I look under resource list, I'll see, okay, RID lock. So I see there was a row lock here on page 7291. And if I go down here, indeed, the other row lock was held on 7291. And if I look here, I could say, okay, well, and one interesting point I want to uh, draw out here is notice there's no slot. You'll see page ID, you'll see database ID, you see file ID. In this case, there's no slot. You don't see the actual row number. So that information is useful from the process section. The other thing you're going to see is the associated object ID, but it's not quite what you think if you've never seen this before. This wouldn't translate to the table that we were looking at before uh, where you said fact internet sales. If you said object name around this number, you wouldn't get that. And I'll just briefly demonstrate how to pull that information. If I hop back to SQL Server Management Studio and I say, okay, in AdventureWorks Data Warehouse, I can query sys.dmdb partition stats where partition ID equals that long number and then pull the object ID associated with that partition ID to get the name of the object. So fact internet sales. We already knew that, but in the case where, let's say the input buffer doesn't show the name of the object, this is another way to get at that object so that that information is not lost. So going through the RID lock, we see this begins here, ends here, and we see owner list. So this says this is the process that owned an exclusive lock on this row. And then this is a waiter. This is a waiting process waiting for a shared lock on that same row. And then vice versa. So we say, OK, this is the other resource. And in this case, the exact opposite. 88 was holding an exclusive lock. So I'm just using the last three digits here. 988 was holding an exclusive lock. And the waiter was uh, E08 versus E08 was holding an exclusive lock on this other row. But 988 was wanting a shared lock. So it's a classic deadlock pattern. So you pull all of that together. Instead of just throwing this XML document out to somebody, you would say, all right, based on this, I know here was the victim. Here was the request that survived. Here were the resources. And in this case, it was two different rows on the same page. Here's the isolation level, the application, the queries. And all of a sudden, you have all this very helpful information. And from that, you can connect those dots to best practices known around deadlocking. So in this case, we would look at isolation levels. Is it appropriate? We might look at indexing. There's all kinds of different options which are beyond the scope of this particular demo video. Uh, but now you at least know how to pull out information so you can get that conversation started. So hopefully this is, uh, has given you a good introduction to interpreting deadlock output. And until next time, thanks for watching and thanks for being a SQL Skills Insider. Take care.